All right. Well, I'm uh, I'm super thrilled to be here with Tom Davidoff. Tom Davidoff is a leading voice in Vancouver on real estate policy, real estate economics. He's a professor at the Sauter School of Business uh, in economics uh, with a focus on real estate and housing in a lot of ways. Um, Tom, thanks for coming on. Real pleasure, Keith. Thank you so much for having me. So the obvious question, Vancouver real estate market, it's been a crazy 12 months. Um, what the hell happened? Totally unexpected. Right. So at the start, I, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen, but if you told me, well, it's going to be, you know, over 12 months of slowdown, I would have said, yeah, wow, that's, that's going to be really bad for housing. Cause when incomes fall, you know, there's other stuff, but uh, you know, in low incomes, low demand for space, bad fundamentals for real estate prices go down. So, so what happened, I think is two or three things. Number one, where incomes fell happened to be, unfortunately, from a social perspective, but a positive for real estate, the, low, the, the declines in incomes were concentrated among a, uh, the lower end of the income distribution where people aren't buying homes. So I think that was a big deal. You know, rents haven't done much and renters generally have lower incomes th than owners. And so the income declines were probably in a renter rather than in an owner category. Most people don't buy homes in a given year. So we had a lot of people whose incomes were not hurt. And, and those people you know, are probably the buyers in this very strong market. So that's one. Two, incredibly low interest rates. Rates have been low since the great financial crisis, like extremely low, and they're even lower today. You know, Borrowing at one and a half percent, you know, your interest cost is just extremely low. If you compare buy versus rent, you know, people are focused on prices, but the, the interest cost is so unbelievably low uh, and has been for, for this entire period. So that's one or two. Uh, we've got the incomes, we've got the low interest rates. And then three, this was a funny economic slowdown. It made you need to be at home and work at home. And as I'm sure uh, many of us uh, are aware, small spaces uh, lead to uh, unpleasantness within the family. You know, who's going to, you're duking it out over a little limited bandwidth, limited space where you can work quietly. Uh, having more space has been uh, really helpful. You haven't had to commute. And of course, that's made suburban real estate in particular look great. You know, extra space, don't mind the uh, commute. And, you know, with home prices, something that when we'll talk about this a lot, I'm sure. What's the, the big question is what's going to happen to the premium for being in a more convenient location? Because until COVID, people wanted to be downtown. Condos were very strong relative to houses ever since the foreign buyer tax. And uh, you know, if downtown comes back, you know, people might kick themselves and say, "Oh man, I'm I'm in this long commute because I committed myself to this house d during COVID when commuting wasn't a big deal." You know, we do see some evidence of that, you know, when you buy a car in the summer, sunroofs are more valuable than in the winter, even though, you know, it's pretty much going to balance out across seasons. With homes, I've heard swimming pools do better in the summer than the rest of the year, even though maybe it makes a difference for one season. So, you know, were people buying based on a COVID reality or post-COVID reality is interesting to ask. I was talking, uh, I was on a session with Benjamin Tall from CIBC the other day, and someone asked him the question, um, is COVID a, an event or is it kind of a, is this who we are now? Um, and uh, so I'd ask you the same question. Is, is COVID something that's, that's happened or is happening and will end at some point? And then we just go back to that normal cycle of activity? Or is this a fundamental shift in how you see us uh, relating economics to housing? Right. So first part, just COVID, COVID, is it ending? It seems like it is because we're all getting vaccinated. But there is this horse race between vaccination and variants of concern. And, you know, parts of the developing world aren't going to get fully vaccinated, it seems like, for quite a long time. Uh, and that gives the variants some running room. So I don't know how inconvenienced we're going to be. You know, I'm thinking about teaching in the fall. I was uh, thinking about teaching to a classroom of masked faces. You know, Zoom's been a drag, but not seeing expressions when I'm teaching is a drag, too. So that diminishes the value of in-person contact. And we've all figured out, uh, you know, for those of us not doing physical labor, uh, how to uh, work by remote. So I asked my undergrads, what do you want when you get a job? And, you know, most of them said they want to have an office, but they don't want to be there five days a week. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty inclined to say don't write off cities. I think it's going to all be okay. People are going to have a demand for being close to downtown again pretty soon. 
but I don't know. It, it wouldn't shock me to see a world where suburbanization takes off. You know, in the in the April sales numbers for downtown Vancouver, we saw finally the downtown condo market pick up primarily under 600,000, which to me is the investor buyer. They've mm -hmm. returned back to the, the downtown core. The higher price condos still haven't picked up the way houses have picked up. Um, uh, overall, everybody feels the heat from the real estate market. It, the stories are endless at this point. There's lots of complaints coming out about realtors, which is yep. you know a natural thing in a in a hot market. The volume when the volume is up, the complaints are obviously going to be up, particularly when everyone's under so much pressure. But the question for you is, does do we still have room to run on prices? Well, given we that have interest no... rates, given that interest rates have kind of edged up a bit. They have a bit, but you know, 30 year rates, I haven't looked at them recently, but they're still super low. Uh, I have looked at them recently. It depends what you call recently like yeah. today. Every, but, everything's in the mid twos now, right? It's 2.3 to 2.5. Uh, whereas six, eight weeks ago, it was 1.9 to 2.05. But I don't, I don't know that we ever even got all the way to adapting to 2.5. I mean, if we say from now on, you know, mortgage interest rates are say three, three and a half percent, you know, if, if we get back to the, the levels of say a year ago. Uh, so, you know, interest rates are always going to be three and a half. That's so low. That's so affordable. When you have uh, price growth of probably north of two CPI plus, you know, a lot of these urban markets are going to grow in value, even inflation adjusted. So, you know, maybe you're at a one percent difference between cost of capital and uh, growth. That leaves huge, you know, cap rates, the, the ratio between rents, net of expenses and price, you know, it, they're not at 1%, they're low, but they're not at 1%. You know, there's a risk issue, but when you're that low, that different, that small of a difference between cost of capital and realistic growth in rents, anything goes for valuation, right? Because you're basically dividing annual rent by a teeny tiny number to get fundamental value. And so, you know, I'm extremely uncomfortable ruling out continued price growth. I think to claim a bubble when you've got so much uncertainty, you've got a denominator close to zero. So just to, you know, this is going to be hard for some people, but, you know, when you've got a denominator close to zero in your valuation of real estate, uh, because so-called cap rates really ought to be low, very small changes in assumptions have huge changes in value. So you talk about a $600,000 condo, nobody can rightly claim to know whether that's really worth 300,000 or a million two. It's just very hard to call that on fundamentals. So I think there's a world where prices continue to grow, absolutely. Uh, but this could all stall out and, you know, at any time. Yeah, so you, much like the rest of us, you have no clue this time around. I, I'm so reluctant to make a call. I mean, yeah. You know, I, my best guess th is things stay pretty strong, but uh, that, that, that's a real guess. Yeah, I've, I've called it in the past. In, in 2012, I saw a downturn. I called it. There was a big price drop for a six-month period. 2016, that was an easy one to call because we had the foreign buyer tax. Um, 2008, you know, at some point, Canada had to get hit. It was minimal, but we took it on the chin. This time, it feels different. There's so many other things going on. The rates are low. Consumer confidence is high. And and as you said, people have a demand for a different space, which they didn't have in 2008, 12, and 16. They they need more space in a lot of cases, or they need different space. They need to live somewhere that they didn't used to live, or they can choose to live where they want to live. Maybe someone who lives in the suburbs didn't want to, you know, they've always wanted to live downtown, yeah. and, and now they can because they don't have to work in the suburbs. So you'll get some of that cross moving back and forth. Um and I don't know if you saw the headline today, CMHC announcing a possibility of a 14% price increase. Um, I was chatting with my friend over lunch and he said, well, if they're as wrong this year as they were last year when they predicted a 20% decline, it could mean that prices could go down 40% next year based off of CMHC's price prediction of 14% increase. I, I didn't see that. Is that their central prediction for one year? Yeah, that's their, their central prediction was up upwards of 14% well, this year. You know, the fact that you and I did not discuss is cash hoarding. I mean, you know, people have not been able to spend money the way they normally do. I mean, you know, North Americans, we love to blow through cash and party and, you know, we haven't been able to. So I think that, you know, there's a lot of cash sitting on the sidelines still. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm less convinced that cash goes into real estate. I, I think once we're allowed to spend and consume again, we will. We're going to go to restaurants. We're going to go to theaters. Everybody wants to get on an airplane. 
Um, I own vacation property in the States and it's been booked out solid at higher, I'm, I'm probably 20% higher rates than I was two years ago. Um, Cause Americans are traveling again quite, quite freely. So Canadians want to get up and get going and spend that money in restaurants and bars. I mean, it's almost not a bad idea to buy a restaurant these days, yeah. just anticipating a flood of money coming in the next couple of months. Yeah. Um, let's look at real estate policy. You're, you're really good about this. You're one of the few economists who actually recognizes um, that there's a political game to be played here as well in uh, you know, levering and controlling the market. Um, we had the foreign buyer tax. Um, what happened? That seems to have not worked because prices are skyrocketing again. Nobody's on planes. Nobody's, you know, we used to get people flying from China, get in the car with their realtor, buy three or four houses for New Year's and fly home. That's not happening and prices are still going up. So was the foreign buyer tax always not really a thing? You know, ex post, it looks like the foreign buyer tax hit the top of the market quite, you know, the very top of the market, I think really did suffer uh, ever since it came down. I don't know that maybe it, at some point came back kind of, but I don't think that the, no. the top of the market hit it, it, its all time peaks. But other segments, you know, the condo market mostly, um, you know, it was up 20, 30 percent, I think, in the six, you know, 18 months after the foreign buyer tax. It took an initial dip, but then had a huge run up. So I think, you know, foreign buyers were a, a thing at the top of the market and they must have had an effect throughout the market. I will say, I think the empty homes and speculation tax, you know, the, the timing, their implementation did seem to coincide with a, a bit of a slowdown. So I think outside money, I don't want to deny that it has a role in this market. Uh, but, you know, uh, I think we have to recognize immigration, household formation, you know, the millennials coming of age to buy homes, incredibly low interest rates. You know, uh, the, the fundamentals are really strong. And of course, this is a very challenging place in which to add supply. So, you know, I think a lot of it's real too. Yeah. Yeah. The, the foreign buyer component, I, I still maintain it was around that 5% number. Yeah. Um, is it Josh Gordon at SFU, your counterpart on yeah. this? Yeah. yeah, he he's he's always rallied against that foreign buyer that they were skewing the market dramatically and it was the reason he couldn't afford a home. But there's no there's no actual evidence of that, is there? Well, it depends again what kind of home he wanted. If he wanted, you know, top of the line uh, British properties, I think he did have serious competition from foreign buyers. If he wanted to buy a condo, a depreciated condo in Surrey, you know, I mean, immigration plays a role, but I, I don't think, you know, outside money leaving the place empty. You know, yeah. I, I think it had some role to play. I, I wouldn't say zero, like you say, 5% something. I think I think at its peak, it was higher, right? When they were reporting those foreign buyer numbers, it was getting higher. So, you know, maybe had you not done anything, we don't have that counterfactual. But to suggest that the reason Vancouver is expensive is entirely empty investment boxes, you know, that's just not correct. Yeah, okay. So what other policy changes can the government come up with? Municipal, provincial, federal, um, the feds are talking about a national, I don't know, they're, what they name these taxes and what they are doesn't really line up. Like the speculation tax is really just a second homes tax. Yeah. The Vancouver vacancy tax, it's arguably a vacancy tax, but it's also a, in a lot of ways a second homes tax. So what the, the feds are talking about a big policy in the latest budget, a national foreign buyer tax. Yeah. Do you think that will have impact on our market? No, I mean, you know, I, and by the way, I like the speculation empty homes tax stuff. I think it, it doesn't hurt and it, and, it, and it helps and it raises revenue, but I don't, it hasn't solved the problem. Uh, you know, so you, you have to look at the demand side and the supply side. For, you know, if you squeeze out all the remaining foreign buyers, what do you at 1% of the market now, something one and a half. So I just don't see how that's going to accomplish uh, much additional if it's a flow tax on people who are already in the market, maybe a bit more bite. But I don't think that that's number one now. I think now we have to address the supply demand imbalance domestically. And you can do demand or you can do supply. I do think demand side measures, you know, could help. I think if you just slapped a federal tax on on expensive homes, sort of like the, the BC tax, except for at a lower level, you know, that would that would suck out demand. We do we, we don't fund schools uh, through property taxes like in the states. And when you get to those super low interest rates, high growth, I think that does make a difference for valuation. So I, I think if you wanted to help out renters, you know, bump up property taxes, I, I think would be helpful. But I don't think that's going to be the, the solution. I think at this point, 
you know, what, and first of all, it's not going to be the solution because it'll never fly politically. This government yeah. is not going to raise property taxes. It doesn't even want to put in a capital gains tax on, on gains north of a half million dollars. So in the set of what's realistic, I think it's supply side. Uh, you know, the feds have invested heavily in rental housing, which is what matters. You know, uh, rent, you know, it's nice if people can afford to buy a home, but it's necessary that they be able to afford to rent a home. Uh, and so expanded rental, condo supply, um, you know, build stuff that people can actually afford, you know, put, put the, you know, hammer lock, carrots and sticks for municipalities to upzone. BC is really good at that. You know, municipalities can charge a lot of money. Vancouver does, Burnaby does, a lot of jurisdictions charge a lot of money to build condos. Uh, uh, and, you know, it gives you bonus if you build affordable density that, you know, they, they save you on fees if you build stuff that's affordable. Um, I think municipalities should be encouraged to do that. And then the other side of it is if there's misbehavior, if you have jurisdictions that are, you know, that just are not adding enough uh, multifamily supply to, to, to build product that's affordable, then I think the province says, all right, look, we gave you the chance to sell this density. You know, you could have made a lot of cash. Maybe we would take 25% of your zoning proceeds, sale of zoning proceeds, and, and put it to a aff direct affordability stuff like a renter's rebate or investment in, in affordable units. But if you're misbehaving, if you're not going to, you know, take that big, the big box for, for selling density, we're just going to impose, you know, we'll build some social housing in your single family zones and, and, and you won't have the power to do anything about it and you get no money. I think that's really, um, I, th I think that could be a pretty helpful set of carrots and sticks in terms of, of, of getting more stuff built. Because I think in terms of what's realistic, don't tax you, don't tax me, tax behind the guy behind the tree. We've taxed the guy behind the tree as much as is going to be helpful. So I think we have to now address the supply side. Yeah, I've always been a supply guy. Back in, um, back in the 70s, Trudeau Sr. changed the capital gains policy for rental properties. You used to be able to build rental property, you could build an apartment building and sell it, take those gains, not pay capital gains and roll them over into another development project. And that's why like the West End of Vancouver, it's filled with all of these great rental properties that have housed you know, thousands of people for decades and decades. And when that ended, that's when we shifted and developers shifted from owning rental properties and building rental properties, which are difficult to sell because you've got a limited pool of buyers, primarily pension funds. And they shifted to strata titled condo properties because those are easier to sell. You could sell them off one at a time and diversify your risk. So little, little changes in taxation policy over the years have really shifted to result in a city full of condos that people largely can't afford to buy, but also a rental stock that people can't afford to live in, which I think is a more important problem to solve. I don't think, you know, everybody believes in affordable housing until it comes time to sell their own house. I've, yeah. I've always said that. And so yeah. when everyone says the government should do something to fix the market, what you're saying is the government should make your house worth less today than less tomorrow than it is today. And not too many people are comfortable with that if they own a home. No, absolutely not. Look, I mean, adding to the supply side, it cuts different ways. If you're a condo owner, I don't see how it's anything other than a negative because it's competition for your space. So, you know, supply side, demand side, either way, you're, you're, you know, you're having an adverse effect on property owners. But people see a property tax. So I just don't see actually taxing domestic owners as being a politically attainable way out. So I think in the set of what's realistic and actually going to have bite, again, yeah, supply. And it's interesting. I think you're a little more pro put the thumb on the scale of rental versus condo. To me, I think the, the first order question is how many roofs are there overhead and how many heads chasing the roofs? You know, yeah. be it condo, a lot of people rent out condos. It's not as good as purpose-built rental, you know, from a tenant's perspective. But, but get, getting homes built, I think, is absolutely critical. Yeah. Um, can, can the government politically get away with a tax on principal residency capital gains? How do you think that'll play out? Because that's obviously, that's, you know, every, every senior bank officer wrote some sort of op-ed piece. It's clear that the finance ministry put them up to this. They were floating this policy all through the spring to kind of gauge the temperature of um, of the Canadian populace on taxing principal residency gains or putting some sort of lifetime limit on it. Um, is that politically feasible? And what would the impact be on house prices? Well, the U.S. has a very strong pro real estate lobby and there's, you know, taxes on capital gains over 500,000 in the states. 
and you know they've actually pulled the plug on some tax credits for uh, home ownership. Uh, you know they raise the standard deduction, which hurts homeowner. It makes it less valuable to own a home for tax purposes. They've taken away state and local tax deductibility. So you can- That was all, that was all part of the, the Trump tax changes, right? Like, right. Uh, ironically, that was one of the things everybody said Trump was all about wealthy people, but Trump really took a, took a run at wealthy homeowners in his tax now, changes. You know, who gets hurt for that? Like business school professor in Berkeley, California is like the number one guy who's getting hurt by that. You know, if you're a rich exterminator in Tulsa, you know, that, that state and local deductibility is pretty yeah. small relative to your set of income. So I think so, it was pretty, so, pretty politically so, so Sham- targeted on their part. Yeah. So champagne socialists got hurt the most. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. That's exactly who got hurt the most. And, you know, if you're a, um, I won't, I won't indulge in stereotypes, but you can close your mind and think of a Trump, close your eyes and uh, close your if mind. You're, and be a, Trump you're a Trump supporter. You're a, a middle American Trump supporter. We yeah, all know what yeah. that looks like. Yeah. And, 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 and they did not get hit by the, that, that property tax reform. But it's, it's right. the point being, I think you could do something here. The more you kick the can down the road, the more so. So, for example, you know, I've discussed this with people. You know, I, I do think we have low property tax rate, but no way the feds are going to step in and tax current homeowners. You could say 10 years from now, you know, we're going to uh, bump the rate by a, a quarter of a percent federally on homes over a million dollars or, you know, and the current owners exempt. You know, if you if you push it far enough away, people are OK. I You'd think, look, I mean, you know, who, who's going to be, I mean, people do get upset. I've seen it on social media. But, you know, if you tell people you're going to pay a tax if your gain is over a half million dollars, but you're grandfathered in on everything you already have. I just can't believe there's that many people who are sweating the state of the world where they've made a half million dollar gain on a property. So I, I think you could sneak something in probably, but yeah. uh, I, I don't I don't think this government wants to from everything I've heard. I, I, I disagree with that. I think this government does want to do that. I think they, you know, they, they were pushed on it in the last election. And there was a CBC story that Andrew, Andrew Shear was fear mongering by suggesting that the libs wanted to push a capital gains tax on principal residency. And there was, there was a policy document floating around that came out. And then this spring, as the budget was approaching, we saw every major financial institution come out in favor of some sort of tax on capital gains and and that you know for those who don't understand politics that's how politics works the feds say to the banks look we'll save you on the regulation over here you got to support us on this policy go out and start beating the drum get the get the op-ed pieces in and get the conversation going so the conversation is there and i think it's you know if the libs pick up a majority it'll be it'll be here inside of that window but your commentary that, you know, if it's pushed out far enough and it's an additional gain over and above what you've already got, people will probably just take it and it wouldn't have a dramatic impact on the market. Yeah. 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 In terms, and in terms of pricing, I think you're right. I mean, I guess that's the issue. If it's going to be politically effective, how much is it going to affect pricing? Because if it's something that's deferred it's for the next buyer, you know, I don't know how it should be on people's mind, right? You should think about the whole discounted flow of taxes and any future tax you impose on homes should subtract from the price people pay today, you'd hope. Uh, but, uh, you know, it may be that people, you'd know better than I, but I'm sure there's a lot of people who buy the biggest house the bank will let them and future yeah. tax burden has nothing to do with that. Yeah, it, irrational exuberance drives a lot of what happens in the Vancouver real estate market. Yeah. Uh, people aren't thinking as detailed as you are. I, I, I can imagine you when you were buying I think you're in kits at this point when you were buying your place, you were probably thinking through all of the possible economic consequences of coming together with that. Whereas most people are thinking, oh, I can live a couple blocks from a really cool beach. How much does it cost? I will pay that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you dress it up in a lot of a spreadsheet and assumptions and then you, and then you, 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 you come up with it. it's next to a cool beach. So I like it. Yeah. Yeah. People make decisions emotionally and then try and justify them rationally. Whereas you know, not that economists aren't people, but you probably make decisions rationally and then try and justify them emotionally. I was fired by one of your colleagues as a client, something that doesn't happen very often, but, uh, you know. <laughs> okay, so a uh, couple of specific questions on Vancouver yeah. as a city. Um, the Broadway line, the subway line coming down Broadway to Arbutus, um, phase one, phase two to UBC, do you think that the prices of that development are baked into properties along that line? Or do you think there's room to grow beyond typical market growth along the Broadway corridor? 
So the last I looked, you know, and I don't know exactly what property you'd be thinking about there, um, you know, like maybe old wood frame apartment buildings would be, you know, sort of close would be the biggest candidate for upzoning, maybe it's some kind of single family within shouting distance. You know, I, I, my best guess is a lot of redevelopment is not priced, my best guess, so, you know. Yeah. I, I, you know, because the premium arguably should be pretty huge. I don't know what the likelihood is of upzoning by which block and, you know, how much you're going to have to give away to the city. But, you know, I'm guessing there's a home run state with more than 25% probability, you know, that, that you don't see priced on, say, I don't know, 11th Avenue, 8th Avenue, something like that. Yeah. What do you think? I, I think it's not quite in there yet. They're in early stages, the Broadway plan. Yeah. Um, they've just gone for a community consult. Uh, it goes from goes kind of like five to six blocks on either side of Broadway. A lot of that's three-story rental walk-ups. And then Fairview is obviously new enough that it won't get rebuilt as part of this plan. Those were all built in the 80s. So there's still some economic life to the housing. Uh, but some of the old three-story walk-ups and kits, I think those would probably do well. The challenge with the city of Vancouver is they're so intent on retaining rental properties that if you've got 10 rental units, you're going to have to Rehow, you're gonna have to move and rehouse those tenants while you're going to redevelopment, which blows your economics out of the water on redevelopment. City of Vancouver construction costs are through the roof because you've got the Canadian building code and then a little bit more intense, you've got the British Columbia building code and then even more intense than anything else in Canada, you've got the Vancouver building code. So building in Vancouver is enormously expensive on a price per square foot basis. And you're dealing with dense areas, so it's even more expensive because you can't leave property on site and the cost of construction and lumber. And this ties into the inflation question I'm going to ask you in a minute. Um, so all of this is to say, I don't, I don't know how, how fast, it, like Vancouver needs more rental property. That would go a long way to solving the quote unquote housing crisis we have. But I don't see the city doing the things necessary to encourage that quick development, taking a three story to a six story, nine units to 25 units and getting more rental properties in there. There's no incentives there for that. That's an enormously capital intensive process for the for the Broadway corridor. Yeah, and you know, there's so much focus on not leaving land lift available, I think. So, you know. Yeah, I, I and mean, if there's not land lift, I don't, you know, uh, as an owner in that area, I wouldn't have the, I wouldn't have the capital to up zone my property. Anyway, so I'm just gonna sit on it yeah. and wait for one of you know, five major developers to get around to my block. Yeah, I, I think there's some confusion with with the how big of a deal, you know, land going up due to speculation is. What matters is how many units there are. You know, land pricing due to speculation. You know, that that's not that that's not causing unaffordability. I I, I just think there's some confusion there. So, I, yeah. I, I think there can be a misgotten focus. That said, I mean, you know, trying to capture some of the upside with con cash contributions. Uh, or affordability requirements is fine. But of course, as you mentioned, you have to leave incentive uh, to, to redevelop. To actually, yeah, if there's no incentive to actually build the property. Um, total out of left field question that you might not be up on. Have you followed any of the politics in the city of Vancouver around the new city plan that Kennedy Stewart promised that nothing has happened on? Yes, I was actually just wondering. I was like, what's what? Because this council is coming to a close in the not too distant future, right? It'll be election time. You know, the last time, I guess it was the lame duck session, people complained about going to duplex in a sort of lame duck session. Yeah. But, uh, you know, they're going to have gone four years without rezoning RS. You know, uh, you still can't build a townhome in 70% of the city, which is bananas. I mean, it's really. Yeah almost criminal, uh, you know, uh, to have, you know, just giant swaths of the city. And you see what happens. I mean, stuff does get built there. And it's, you know, sometimes maybe there's a, you know, a laneway or duplex, but this is suburban almost density in a, in a place where square feet are selling for over a thousand bucks a square foot. So you have to address that. And I think it's just a giant failure. You know, they, they, they kicked the can. They didn't do anything about RS. They said, well, let's do a giant city plan. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know that a city plan... I don't know. I mean, is there some theme? I think you just make a bunch of good decisions in a row as a council or, or a planning department. I don't know that you need to hold up all decisions, you know, to make them all simultaneously to have a grand vision for the city. So well, I, think Vancouver a, I, I don't think that's a great, I, I like, you know, the individual councillors, I, th I feel like, you know, they're, they're doing okay, uh, vote by vote. 
but to go four years, we've RS, you know, duplex was the last council. So I, they, they, they ought to have something accomplished by the end. And I'm not sure they will have. No, I think they're too busy fracturing their political parties into as many political parties as possible. I think <laughs> I think there's going to be five or six prominently uh, prominent mayoral candidates all fielding their own slate of uh, council candidates. It's going to be a real dog's breakfast next time around. I, 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 it's so interesting to consider how it's going to work. I mean, the NPA, I, you know, that 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 that's a story, and then you know you have. Uh... Ken Sim uh, and Mark Marriton were both very clever guys, but running at this point without parties. So I, I just, I'd be very interested to see how it's going to go. You know, yeah. for, for council, uh, okay. bike lane extremism is the way to go, either pro bike lane or against, you know, you have many, many candidates in many slots. So, you know, I actually asked this on a business and government exam, right? You know, you want, you want to be on the extremes, you know, usually you think politicians hover in the middle. I think bike lane extremism is what I would run on to, to get onto council. But for mayor, of course, it's a different story. And so, you know, who knows what's going to happen there? Well, you know, Gregor ran on bike lane extremism yeah. for a number of elections in a row. And, and the first time he ran against Peter Ladner, um, well, after he, you know, after Peter took over for Sam yeah. uh, as the candidate, he ran against Peter. Peter was a bike lane enthusiast, but Gregor was a bigger bike lane enthusiast. Yeah. So your extremism was like kind of extreme yeah. versus like extremely extreme. That's right. And so your point is well taken. The extremely extreme candidate won and got to be mayor for 10 years. Sure. And the kind of extreme candidate is just a guy who lives in Vancouver now. Right. And so so the NPA is going going there on mayor is the point, right? They're going on the on the right wing of the bike bike lane question. And you yeah. know that you definitely get some votes that way. So if you know if there's enough of a pile up in the center or center left, maybe they make it. Yeah, John Cooper doesn't strike me as a, a cyclist, the NPA mayoral candidate. Um, okay, I want to end with this concept that we've been hearing a lot about. I'm turning 40 this year, and my generation is uh, really unfamiliar with this concept. Uh, it's going to happen as a result of, I think, $500 billion of federally printed money, and that is the concept of inflation. Um, can you explain for us in uh, as simple terms as possible what inflation is and yeah, how sure. it will impact how it will impact the real estate market uh, going forward? Well, I guess you have two questions embedded in there. Can I explain maybe and can I tell, say what it's going to do to the real estate market? That That's even harder. So, uh, you know, prices rise over time, you know, incomes go up, there's more money sloshing around. And when there's money sloshing around, uh, you know, the price level tends to rise. In this recession, the central banks through, you know, quantitative easing and just standard monetary policy have been aiming to keep rates low, interest rates low. And that involves, you know, essentially swapping out, uh, you know, purchasing bonds and handing cash into the private sector to get spent. And so it has gotten spent, but largely <laughs> in home purchases. So, you know, I, I actually don't know what CPI is running, you know, this year. There are, you know, um, CPI truthers who will tell you that, I don't know, you know, in, inflation is rising, even, even if the statistics don't say so. Um, so, you know, what's amazing is we've had incredibly low inflation despite active Federal Reserve policies around the world, you know, for 10, 15 years since the great financial crisis. So, you know, people are waiting for the other shoe to drop. And, you know, you might think, well, I don't really think so because Western countries don't have inflation. Like you say, if you're 40, if you're going to turn 50 this year, you do vaguely remember from welcome back, Cotter and good times, people were complaining about inflation when you were a kid and, you know, 14% interest rates. Uh, which imagine a 14% interest rate today would be, you know, catastrophic. The good news is the inflation usually happens when people are doing well economically. Uh, but, you know, if you have uh, something like the stagflation we saw in the past, you know, if you have not a great economy plus consumer prices running up at a high rate, that means banks need to charge higher interest rates to compensate them for the value of a depreciating dollar over time. And so, uh, you know, high interest rates, you know, with no compensation in terms of income and rents would be, you know, catastrophic, of course, for a real estate valuation. Back in the 70s, I should say, though, people thought high interest rates and inflation were great for property values. Now, on the on the investment side, you know, investors get to deduct interest in the states. Homeowners kind of do, too. 
Uh, but, you know, capital gains, as long as they're untaxed, you know, a high capital gains rate environment is favorable for real estate in that way. You know, your mortgage gets paid off partly as, as your wage grows and, and you know, the, the balance stays constant. So, you know, inflation can cut both ways. If, if it's uncompensated, if all you had was 12% interest rates, though, today, could you imagine? I mean, that would just be complete devastation for the market. Yeah, there's nothing pointing to going in that direction either, but because that would be complete suicide for the government uh, with the volume of of debt and deficit that they're running at this point. You know, yeah, this it would whole be debt death, to right? GDP so, and you know maybe get into some kind of currency crisis type thing. You know, the bond markets don't think it's going to happen, as we said at the at the outset. You know, I think rates are something like what yeah. you say two and a half percent out as far as the eye can see. So people don't expect catastrophic inflation, but you know, yeah expectations so, matter if things can change so so generally inflation you don't see inflation as a risk to the current real estate market oh i see it as a trust. risk oh if i was going to name the, the the risks to the real estate market i'd put you know it, we, we haven't seen healthy economies with super low interest rates like we have in the past uh, okay so yeah, I'd say rates jumping is, is a big risk and, and people don't hedge it. You know, you get a five-year interest rate. What happens after five years? There's a stress test which says five and a quarter. Rates can certainly go to five and a quarter or higher. So I think it's a real yeah. risk factor. Yeah, we're not generally requalifying people on the stress test, um, you, but you're also not able to shop your loan if you have to requalify. So Correct. you're kind of limited Correct. to the lender you're with. Correct. Uh, and I saw you had something on Twitter the other day about the stress test. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I shrug, shrug your shoulders. And you're like, oh, it turns out the stress test works. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I you know, I asked realtors, I thought, you know, the stress test makes you qualify, uh, you know, for a mortgage based on your income at a, at a higher payment than you're making today, because they say, well, geez, what if rates rise? And they've made it tighter at, you know, five and a quarter percent, which is way above rates today, more than two percent above. So, uh, you know, but the, but the problem, you know, is maybe that doesn't affect too many people because most people are fine on payments. It's, it's the down payment they like getting to 5% of a million dollar property. You know, it takes a time to accumulate 50,000 bucks, uh, you know, for a first time buyer. So I asked, real, you know, realtors and mortgage people, you know, what do you see more often? Do you see no constraint? Do you see uh, down payment constraint or do you see payment to income constraint? And, you know, not somewhat to my surprise, it was, it was payment to income. Yeah, in, in Vancouver, that seems to be the issue. Uh, grandma and grandpa, mom and dad, they've been very generous in this wealth transfer that's occurring yeah. throughout North America, but Canada and the West Side in particular. So that generation has money to put down and they can afford the payments based on the rate. They can afford the payment because they're getting some rental income from a basement right. suite, but the banks aren't qualifying the rental income as true income. It's getting it's deducted. Was, yeah, it, some of it's even less because they'll qualify it as income. So you get a thousand dollars for your basement suite. They qualify it as a thousand dollars of income. Right, so you get a third of it. Then they, you get a third of it, right? Because they take your taxes off and do your debt servicing off of that. So three hundred dollars of qualification on a thousand dollars of rental income, which supports two hundred thousand dollars of mortgage, is only supporting sixty or seventy thousand dollars of mortgage. So they can afford the payments if they can get the loan. It's just about getting across the line to get the loan. Yeah. Um, I did see a number the other day that uh, from CIBC that the uh, co-signing of parents and guarantors is up 40% um, over the past year uh, for getting through those loans. So it people can afford sense. them. They're, yeah. they're just not, they just can't afford them on, you know, on paper, but they can afford to make those payments. Cause I don't think there's many parents out there subsidizing their millennial children to live. They're giving them a capital infusion and then they're signing off on their loan with them and letting the kids run with it. Yeah, thirty percent. You know, there's no law that says. Well, there is a there's a rule uh, in terms yeah. of lending, but there's no law that says you know payments have to be thirty percent of your income. I'm sure there's a lot of renters paying more than thirty percent on rent, and nobody's banning that. No, I mean it's just it's always going to be more expensive to live in Vancouver than it is in Winnipeg, and a lot of the jobs pay the same. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, um, Thank you for a wide ranging and broad discussion. Uh, there's very few people in the city who can talk um, so intelligently about so many different things. So I appreciate you being here with me and we're gonna have this out on um, 
we'll have this out on social. We'll have this in a couple of different places for people to watch and hopefully they can get themselves informed about uh, what's about, what's happening and what's about to happen. Oh, terrific. Thanks. Great.